Awesome. We're so excited to be here with you today. Um, Rachel and I thought it would be fun to kick off. I think we, we've been doing a lot of talking, at least in our office, and I think Rachel and I had a good laugh about it, trying to understand what people are hiring and firing during this time. Um, given, given the unprecedented times, I think, over the last couple of months, what are the, we wanted to throw a question out to you all, and then we'll share our deep, dark secrets with you about what we're hiring and firing. But wanted to ask the audience really quickly, what are the things in your lives since this all began that you've been hiring and firing? Um, Rachel, do you want to share what you've been hiring, firing? Sure. So I've been hiring, I think one of my favorite things is slippers. Um, so I really enjoy wearing my slippers every day and, com and, not, and comfortable shoes and I'm hopeful for the day that I go back into the office where I can still wear my slippers. So I'm definitely hiring slippers for sure. Um, I am firing the hustle and bustle of the morning routine. I think uh, there's like, I, I do not miss the having to, I have a seven year old. So, you know, getting up and like having to get out and snap, snap, snap. And I feel like even though there's still things to do on time, there's just, a little less stress about getting it out the door. So that I'm going to figure out how to fire. Forever. That's awesome. I've been thinking about it much like many of the people who are zooming in here saying what they're hiring and firing. I love seeing this hiring grandparents, margaritas, excellent. Uh, <laughs> thinking through pants. So for me, it's been pants with buttons. I've given them up and I don't know if I'll ever go back. Uh, I couldn't even get myself to hire them for this, this presentation this morning. But, uh, and then I, I think for me, it's, Firing my car has been the greatest thing. So um, it's nice to let those sit and just walk everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> it's a fun time to be thinking about what are the things that you can give up. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of digging into what is it that consumers, much like all of us, don't want to go back to when this is all over. So it'll be interesting to see how exactly. it all uh, shakes out. Yeah. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and jump in and we'll tell you a little bit more about us and, and what we do and our roles. Um, I'll start out by talking a little bit about the Garage Group just so you've got background information about us um, as we set the stage for the rest of our conversation today. Um, we're really on a mission to help big companies operate with more courage in the face of uncertainty and to think through how leaders and their brands um, can, can stay relevant by leveraging more startup inspired approaches. So thinking, how do you, how do you move quickly, um, but do that in a meaningful way that really has a lasting impact on the business and, and keeps it relevant. We, we really do, um, in our work, seek to inspire leaders to lean in with courage as they tackle their most uncertain strategy and innovation challenges. And so setting that as the stage for how we work together today and, and what Rachel, who is one of the most courageous leaders that I've seen, um, how, how she led through this and I think has um, helped to really reimagine some of the work that they're doing there at RB. So it's really exciting to, to be here with you today, Rachel, and to have us talking about this. Same, very much so. Awesome. So here's the overview, just so you've got clarity into what it is that we'll discuss over the next 30 or so minutes. We're gonna dive in and tackle the challenge. And so Rachel will share more with you about what it is that the challenge was at RB. Um, we'll talk through what the approach was that we took together and then focus on some of what Rachel saw as really the key enablers throughout the process uh, and, and the results and lessons learned as a part of this. I think for us, this is a really exciting opportunity to partner on building out a, what, what looks like now a really great brand architecture for the future um, of the brand that Rachel was working on. So we will plug forward and dig into this and bring you all along in the process. And we look forward to engaging your questions once this all wraps. So great. Rachel, it'd be really great to hear from you about what the challenge was that you undertook uh, and your insight background and, and more about how you you came into RB and, and uh, yeah, everything there. Great. Um, we um, had recently set up a, a vitamins, minerals, and supplements uh, category business unit. So an end-to-end -end business unit for vitamins, minerals, and supplements, and really looked at the business and said, how do we treat supplements uh, and this business uh, differently from our OTC business or our hygiene business? And you'll learn very quickly that the supplement business is very, it's, it's a bit like the fashion business. You have a lot of 
uh, trends that are happening very quickly. Um, but you also have a lot of science that happens in the back in the background as well. So you need to be very agile. Um, but we call it agility with authority. So how, how do you make sure that you're being agile, but in a rigorous way uh, that you're not being careless um, and agility does not, you know, equal carelessness. And I think sometimes people think agile just means go fast without thinking. And it's really about creating um, the right structure in order to go fast and make decisions quicker. Um, so we would actually, it's funny, we would actually joke about how uh, we were going to create this like category business unit and we would put it in our garages, right? Um, and because we wanted to act like a startup. And then I came across the garage group and I was like, oh my God, I have to talk to them. <laughs> what do they do? Um, so we had a, uh, we have our brand Move Free, which is uh, one of our biggest brands. It's actually probably as big as Airborne, which many of you uh, know, but you may not all know Move Free, uh, which is a joint supplement brand. Um, and we really wanted to move it from being a functional joint supplement brand to elevating it to being a movement brand. And we knew that we had opportunity to expand within our core and drive significant growth um, by making that jump from be joint to, to movement. Uh, and we had done a lot of consumer immersions um, and we had all these ideas, but we didn't quite know how to put them together and make sense of them. And so we uh, reached out to the garage group to said, can you help us put together a brand architecture so that we can then develop innovation, communication, uh, who is, you know, who's our consumer? How do we want to grow this brand and really develop then a growth strategy behind the brand? Um, and that was ultimately the challenge that we gave the garage group and we needed to do it quickly. Uh, and we needed it to be very simple to enable the entire organization that works in this brand to take it and run with it. I think it's interesting for folks who may have attended Elaine's talk yesterday. She talked a lot about leveraging digital insights to be able to really get in with the consumer and, and how RB is doing that. I think it's interesting because we definitely saw some of the the what had come out of that i think you had a ton of really great consumer insights which was part of what we were i think wading through to get to the simple in all of this um which was interesting and i think you and the team had done a lot of really great upfront work as well absolutely it was almost too much well, data away <laughs> it was analysis paralysis that was going yes. on a little bit yeah it was good though i mean it gave a really good background i think you had one one thing just to note, I think, as we think about this challenge, too, is RB has defined in many ways the strategic territory that they already wanted to go into, which made it made it really great to go in and say, which directions do we want to go, which which directions might we take the brand within the territory, which was um, which was fun. Great. So in order to, to dive in and talk through the approach, we're going to walk through um, the Garage Group's Lean Growth Playbook and just share a, a brief sort of overview of what that looks like. So when we tackle challenges and when we met with Rachel and her team, we really think about them through this lean growth, lean growth playbook lens. It's, it's an arc that we follow in terms of how we tackle these uncertain challenges. So dive in and really define what, what is the opportunity, where is there space to play? Um, then go through this exploring the possibilities. So how do we leverage divergent thinking to look at many of these ways in and look at what they might, how they might come to life, leveraging iterative consumer feedback um, before we then sort of converge on what might be our, our smaller set of, of ways forward. And then on the back end, how do we build, test, and learn on that to refine the solution in order to ensure that what we're putting in market really looks like what consumers understand and, and are excited about. Um, we believe that there is great strength in leveraging different parts of these methodologies that you see on the screen at different points in the process in order to get to that quick iterative uh, process that delivers good results. I think for this particular challenge, we were really focused on more the define and explore phases of this. Um, but we leverage that process of building and testing and learning throughout. And Rachel and I will dig into that a little bit more in terms of what that looks, on, looks like and how we leverage that iterative process throughout uh to get at consumer learnings and insights to drive this forward awesome so 
Rachel, you had, this is when you and I were chatting and getting ready for this, this is one of those things that really stuck with you that we talked through. I'd love to kind of hear from you about what it was about this Marie Kondo. For those of you who don't know, this is Marie Kondo, who's a um, professional organizer. Um, but what it was about this analogy that stood out to you as we embarked on this journey. You know, I would uh, try to in interviews, one of, one of the things that I'm, I, when I hire someone, I really like to make sure that they have strong strategic thinking and then can execute that thinking. And trying mm -hmm. to evaluate in an interview how somebody can do that is quite difficult. Um, so I would often ask the question to people, how do you approach strategy? And I kind of felt like I was always looking for, and I never got the answer I, I wanted. I, it would help me, but <laughs> I never got the answer I wanted. Um, and I, I think I was always kind of looking for some sort of answer about organization. And so, but I couldn't really articulate that either. Um, and so then when, when you guys came in and told my team, me and my team is this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to organize. I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is exactly what, I've been trying to articulate about what a good strategy needs to do. Um, it and I everything needs a home. And so I feel like a good strategy means that you understand I have this great idea and and where do I put it? Where does it go? Why does it go there? Or once you have the architecture, then ideas start flowing very easily because you have an organ, you know, organization. Um, and so I felt like it was a really great way to talk about how a good strategy needs to be simple and make sense so that you can figure out how you make the right choices to put things where they go. Um, and that it was actually helped kind of debate because, and make things easy because if you have, you know, if you organize your closet and you have all, you're organized by color and you have a red shirt, well, it's very easy. You very quickly make that decision that that red shirt goes in that part of the closet. Um, versus if you have a red section and a yellow section and then suddenly an orange shirt comes in, well, at least now you can debate. You can have a good debate about where does it go and it sort of aids the conversation. And so I felt like, I was like, this was exactly the interview answer I was looking for. It's a good tip for anyone who's going to interview with you yes. uh, someday. Exactly. <laughs> Marie Kondo. <laughs> That's awesome. I think it's interesting because that, that idea that, you know, what, what brings you joy or what serves you well as a brand is, is sort of how this ladders up into this Marie Kondo analogy. She talks a lot about what brings you joy. Let go of the things that don't bring you joy. And as a brand, things that don't bring you joy, much as we discovered when we were working, right, there are a lot of products that aren't necessarily serving the brand well, especially once you, once you get a solid architecture. And it was so interesting to watch your team just make really quick decisions that like, yep, we can let go of that. We can let go of that. Um, or we need to maybe change that in order for it to fit within this particular pillar. I think that was, that was a, a really great process to see you all go through, but um, I'm glad this resonated with you. And it'll be good to see if anyone here ends up interviewing with you later using that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that was one thing uh, when we were talking about products and uh, does it fit? Um, and then also feeling like, well, actually, we didn't have this structure before. And now that we ha are thinking about the structure, do we want to let go of it? Do we want to push it further in this direction or push it further in this direction to have it fit better? Because um, I also say things don't also always, if you're retroactively putting an architecture or strategy, things don't always fit so nicely into that. So you either have to let go of it, but it allowed also for us to create a good debate about, well, if it goes here, we need to, um, you know, if this was the fast and effective uh, pillar, it needs to talk more about that versus if it's daily performance. Um, so it was, it gave us opportunity to put it in either direction. I think that's great. And as we dive into more of the overview and talk a little bit more about um, sort of the takeaways here and what were the enablers, I think we'll dive more into that because it, it, I think there's a rich conversation to be had there for sure. I think one of the things just for the people who are watching at home, um, as you think through how this process went, it really was, as Rachel and I were chatting earlier, I think there was a lot of research that they had and we dug in to call it down and say, okay, they've defined the strategic territory and we leveraged both a social media ethnography and then a competitive landscape assessment 
to really identify what possible directions could we take the brand within this strategic territory. Um, and that was the pre-work, right? And, and then we came into day one and really it was over a three-day process that we were able to get to what does this architecture look like? And not only that, but what is the plan moving out of this? Um, so just for you watching at home, you'll see, you can, you can all read, but it really on day one was, let's break into looking at what these different brand directions might look like. So we use this process of diverging and then converging. Um, and so we diverged and said, okay, let's explore these four brand directions and see what it would look like to have the brand really live with this architecture or what could a possible architecture look like within each of these brand directions. Um, the team broke into sub teams, worked through canvases to say, what could possible pillars be? Uh, what, where would our current products live? Uh, how might, wh who might be our target consumers here? And then at the end of day one, we shared those out and the team aligned on which one of those brand directions felt like it was, had the most potential um, for, for the brand. Um, and, and then we moved into day two where we said, okay, we're gonna take this one brand direction and we're gonna divergently explore what possible pillars could look like. So we broke into sub teams, the team built out number of pillars, and then we came back together and said, which of these, which of these brand, which of these pillars or which of these architectures best serve the brand again, moving forward. Um, and so by the time we got to day three, we really had a solid architecture and we're able to spend the day thinking through what then does it look like uh, to bring this to life and what needs to be true in order for the team to get this activated as quickly as possible. Rachel, do you have any thoughts on that or just builds that you think would be helpful here? Yeah, I think, um, and Heather, you mentioned it before that we, we had um, a good amount of data, particularly this, these, this opportunity space data that we had, which really delved into uh, need states and consumer tribes. And part of the challenge was every time we tried to explain it, uh, it was like, okay, I just really need, someone was like, this is complicated. Just tell me like simply how to, how to communicate this. Um, and the other piece was that we, um, in that data, we knew we had uh, an, an older consumer, um, but the data that we had showed that they were this like advancing achiever that they, you know, which to us always meant like this marathon runner. And we didn't quite understand the nuance of that. Um, and I always refer back to when we spoke to, uh, when, we, when we did the iterative process and kind of went back to use real-time consumer feedback um, we got to speak to, I think his name was Joe and he was like 56 years old and he was an ex Navy SEAL. Um, and he doesn't, he, he doesn't do what he used to do when he was a Navy SEAL, uh, but he still wants to keep an active life. And so when things started to slow him down, when he would get stiff joints, um, and he couldn't, you know, go out and garden, you know, that was really upsetting to him because he used to be a Navy SEAL. I mean, he, he, uh, so it started to give color um, to who we were really trying to talk to and, and who that person was um, and help us validate that this, um, these pillars that we were creating do make sense for that consumer and for us to be able to communicate that in a way that people can understand and relate to. Um, so throughout the process, I think that um, helped us refine um, and be able to communicate it out to others and explain it to others in an easy way. Yeah, I think that was really exciting to see your team and the ways in which they were bringing back the learnings and sharing them with each other. And even to hear you still talking about Joe was really fun um, because that, that obviously was lasting for you all. Um, and, and so it's exciting to hear that seven months later, Joe lives on. <laughs> we still talk about Joe, yeah. <laughs> we do. <That's> <laughs> I bet Joe would love to know that. Yes. Um, so as we, I'm going to dig in here, Rachel, with you, and I would love to hear, I know when we chatted earlier, you were talking about what some of the key enablers were that really helped you and the team move forward. So I'd love to know from you, which of these really, I know, um, kind of is top of mind and or resonates most strongly and, and what it was about those things that, that helped the team move forward or propel forward with a new direction and, and architecture. Yeah, I think uh, the iterative consumer touch points is, is some of what I spoke about with, with Joe. And uh, we had a fantastic cross-functional team that joined us. So it was marketing, it was our R&D, our medical team, 
consumer insights, obviously. I don't know if Justine's on the line um, from RB, but she, uh, she was there. Uh, we had the whole team there. Um, and when we broke off into groups and we each had our own ideas based on the data, uh, then having the opportunity to, to reach back to consumers and talk to them about it and then adapt uh, the next round based on what they said, I think was really important because a lot of times I feel like in a traditional way, we would spend weeks, if not months, creating some sort of strategy or architecture. Then we'd have this kind of one opportunity to talk to consumers and then you'd go back and it, it just was too long of a process and we weren't able to have the consumers help us in the journey. And for me, having the consumers in the middle of the journey instead of the end of the journey was a really critical piece uh, because it allows them to almost help you build it along the way in a way that's really quite meaningful instead of just a validation. Um, and it gave, gave you much more insights and much more depth around what we were trying to create. So I think the iterative consumer touch points was really critical throughout the process in order to ensure that they're almost co-creating with you um, in that. From a stakeholder engagement, like I said, we had multiple people in the, in the room. Um, so we had a lot of the key stakeholders uh, from key cross functions in the room. And then our uh, general manager of uh, VMS came in at the end. And I think uh, what was really important there was we had to very quickly explain to him our thinking. Um, and that meant it needed to be simple. Uh, and, and he was probably one of the ones that challenged us the most on uh, making the opportunity spaces that we were working on much more simple and how it's gonna come to life for the brand. Um, and what this work really helped us do is show how does it come to life for the brand? How is it not just learnings or theories on a piece of paper, but how do I see this live with the brand? And so having that in this three-day process was critical in sort of moving fast, quick, moving fast um, and making decisions quickly. Um, so stakeholder, the right, having the right stakeholders in the process building and then also uh, towards the end of the process. Um, and of course you spoke about converging and diverging and this is one of uh, my favorite things about uh, innovation and strategy is you have to diverge before you converge. And I think it's also something that um, some people don't, if they're very focused on brand activation, uh, they get very uncomfortable with diverging. And they're like, wait, 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 but where are you going? And it's like, just, trust the process. Um, and so uh, the garage group was great about ensuring everyone trusted the process. Um, especially at RB, we could, we kind of like want answers quite quickly. Um, but you have to go through that process and you have to kind of test it out a little bit and work it a bit to, could, to figure out where it can take you. Um, and so you can't make decisions too quickly in the process. And again, we're talking about three days. So uh, still quite, uh, you know, a short process, but you have to allow yourselves to the what ifs um, and what does it look like if I went this way uh, is really critical so that you feel more confident when you um, come back and start to converge. Um, and then I think that says, because I can't see because now I see the pictures, hustle like an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's that what we talked about. I think it's um, just that idea of moving quickly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, these are at RB, we pride ourselves on these are our brands. We own them, we drive them, um, and we want everyone that works on that brand to treat it like their own. Um, and again, I think that actually all of these kind of work together because I think having that team be passionate about how, about what we want to do with this brand and how we want to move it forward uh, gave us energy to want to move quickly um and make decisions quickly and i think that the team had a large appetite to be able to make decisions quickly um because we had tried in, uh, in the past with all this work that we had it wasn't just opportunity spaces but we had done consumer immersions before and it wound up being just learnings on a piece of paper um and it was great we knew more but we didn't really know what to do with it and i think we had to hustle and we had to kind of put a fire under uh, to really start to make things happen. It was interesting, I think, 
um, a couple of things. One, just thinking about, you mentioned this, but like just the diversity of the team in the room from a functional perspective and even regional perspective, I think was super helpful to enabling this process. And I know you're not going to say this, but I will tell people that who are watching, I think you're, the, the, the leadership in this and Rachel's leadership and ability to know that the right people were in the room, but also to make sure that they felt empowered to use their voices and to bring forward any of their concerns or thoughts was really incredible to watch. I think you as the leader of this team really spent a lot of time sitting back and listening to other people hash things out and allowed their voices to sort of raise to the surface, which was really powerful in this too. Because by the time we got to the end, I think the whole team had bought into it and felt like they were true partners in this instead of feeling like they were doing what you had wanted along this process, which was really powerful to watch. And I think a uh, testament to the way that you, you are leading the brand and the team forward. So I think that's a really good thing for folks at home to keep in mind if you're in this process is how do you, how do you enable your team to really own this um, and guide them, but not not have them attached to your vision um, along the way. So I thought that was our, our whole team came back and was really uh, in awe of the way that that shook out. And then I think the other piece of all this is the team at RB was so committed on that last day to saying, great, like who's going to take what, what needs to happen in order for this to happen tomorrow, right? Like we ended up building out a 24 month plan. Um, but people weren't afraid to stick their names up there and say, I'm going to take this and I'm going to take action on this and you're going to take action on this and like, let's go, uh, which was really awesome too. Uh, you had a team of activators ready to go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think, um, I think enabling the team, uh, a lot has to do with I, I being humble and knowing that I, I don't know the answer, right? I may have an idea of what I would do. Uh, but it's not the only answer. I think, uh, you know, I've learned in the world, there's, you know, multiple answers to the same question. Um, and so co-building that and making sure that, you know, I, I love when I learn from my team. So um, it, it ultimately got us to a much better place. And then we wouldn't, we would be remiss not to have some sort of results. If you were to think about what is the biggest takeaway for you or lesson learned in all of this, what would you say it is? Ooh, lesson learned. Um, I think um, there's a, not just one, I think one, um, not to overwork it. I feel like we had spent probably a year before this trying to overwork and overcomplicate. Um, and it was really helpful to have the garage group there to say, you know, we would suddenly start to like want to make sure everything fit so neatly into the, the data that we had in front of us. Um, and it was great to be reminded to kind of like just take a step back and don't go, you can't get yourself lost in there because you'll lose the bigger picture. And so this idea of kind of making sure you're taking a look at the bigger picture um, while also being grounded in data versus getting lost in the data. And I think that was a really good reminder. Um, and, and the garage group, you guys did a fantastic job of keeping us in check because we would, we would get lost in that data. And I was like, okay, just take a step back. Uh, you know, and this is why the touch base with consumers were important too. So I think this idea of don't overwork it, um, dedicate the time and commit to it. Um, you know, three days is a lot of time, um, but those three days saved us a lot of time over the long run um, in order to make sense and then move forward. Um, and so don't, again, don't overwork it, but, you know, make those decisions. And once you have it, um, don't let it be a piece of paper um, and just make sure you're actioning on it. That's great. Really helpful. All right, and we've got one last takeaway to share, but I, I think this is something that came out probably a month ago once we all went into quarantine or shelter at home. Um, it's a Simon Sinek quote, and he says, these are not unprecedented times, right? There are many cases where change or something unexpected has put companies out of business or made companies come out stronger. How will, how will we do what we are going to do in a different world or how we do what we're doing in a different world? The world is different. And the opportunity is what will be, not how do we preserve what we have. And I love this relevant to this type of challenge because I think a brand architecture and figuring out a brand architecture that serves you well is all about imagining what will be and not that how do I hold on to this shirt that I never wear, right? How do I, how do I let go of what doesn't serve us and what isn't helping consumers today? Um, and won't help them tomorrow. And so we wanted to leave this with you as sort of a last thought as we go into the question and answer. But I know, Rachel, it has been such a pleasure to, to partner with you on this. And I'm excited 
uh, to stay in touch and, and to see what comes of all this, because you certainly are someone who leads with courage. And I learned a lot just from your leadership in this process. And so this has been a lot of fun. And um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I, I love where it says, uh, what will we be, not how do we preserve what we have and how that correlates to the architecture? Because, you know, you said uh, that we easily were willing to give things up, but then of course, when Bush comes to shove, but in the process, like during that process, what you would hear people say is, oh no, this architecture won't work because I don't know where to put this existing product. Yeah. <laughs> but like, do we need this existing product? Does something else come in its place? And so I think there's often, and I found that again, I, I have, uh, I oversee six brands plus new white space and they're each have their own unique space, but you find often when you're trying to, and some of these are small brands, this, this happened, move free happens not to be a very small brand, but we have brands like mega red, uh, which are small in terms in comparison to our brands like Mucinex. Um, and so when you want to drive transformational growth, um, you, absolutely need to consider what will you be not how do you preserve what we have now that doesn't mean that in the future what what you have can't still exist but um i would caution that this is i think a really important point um and it makes us in marketing and brand very uncomfortable sometimes when we have something in our portfolio and we don't just want to delete it but maybe we need to re reimagine it um, and I think that's a really important point. I think also this now more than ever, um, what I've learned during this time is um, architecture also helps you focus and prioritize. And I think now that, you know, we're, our, our roles in the world have expanded, you know, we're employees, some of us are moms or dads, wives and husbands, and now teachers and housekeepers. And um, uh, we have so much more in our plate to try to manage and juggle. Um, and the more that you can focus and prioritize um, and make those decisions about what, what, how you can drive growth within the guardrails, um, the easier it is. Um, and so I think now more than ever, as we have to say yes and no to things because we can't do it all, um, this type of architecture really helps you make those decisions. That's great. Well, we will kick it over to questions. Thank you guys. That was awesome. And I don't know if you could really see the chat blowing up, but I think that of all the sessions that we've had, and we are solidly into day two, the chat was the most active in this session. Um, and you were up against some good competition there. So great job, everyone engaging. It was so fun to see. Um, we had a question come in. I would like to see, uh, to hear a bit more about the converge diverge process the ins and outs and how you move through it. It's super interesting. Heather, you want to, you want me to take a stab at that? Sure. Go for it. Um, I think in this particular process, um, we started out with, we had this brand uh, move free. We wanted to elevate it from joint to movement. And I think the first question is, well, how do you elevate it from joint to movement? And so the work that was done on the social ethnographies um, was really looking into movement. And so what are the different ways we could go into movement? Um, for example, uh, you know, we ultimately landed on uh, movement begets movement, which is the more you move, the more you, you wanna move, right? And so how do we then encourage and enable movement, but there were other ways in too that I actually, I don't recall at this time, but kind of saying, okay, I could go in these directions and let's talk through kind of what these directions are um, and pressure test them a little bit. And so uh, there may be a direction that someone automatically may be like, oh, that's not gonna work. But you kind of have to work through that and figure out what the possibilities are before you kill it. Um, because you learn a lot in that process and you learn about uh, some of the the depths of what that could be. Uh, it could also, you know, be a what if process um, and then say, okay, well, now that we've gone through that process, you know, we're going to start to make decisions and say, okay, now we're going to choose movement begets movement. So we made a choice. So we're getting closer to uh, converging. And now that we made the choice on um, wh what our true north is, what could the pillars be? And so we ultimately had people in groups create those pillars of what those ideas are. And so then again, there were multiple iterations of these pillars. So we were still exploring 
um, and diverging on what could be. And then ultimately we had to keep making decisions until we got to one answer. Um, and so uh, that to me is how I view, uh, you know, converging and diverging. And I think um, in a lot of the research that I, all the great research that I've been a part of, my favorite ones are the ones, especially in innovation, um, but also, you know, for things like architecture, where you really allow yourself the time to converge. Um, and I think that for, it, it can make some in commercial and marketing uncomfortable because they just wanna to get to market. Um, and then they're like, okay, why am I talking about, like, for example, in brain health, why am I talking about creating a, a VR experience when I'm like a supplement product? But um, so you don't wanna kill ideas. You really wanna, well, you wanna understand why that can live. Um, because it ultimately would probably make the supplement that you create a better supplement because you thought about that VR experience. Great. We also had a question um, about the brand pillars specifically. Did it lead to expanding the marketing team? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, I think we we had already have on Move Free because we had a we have a global business. We had already had quite a large team for um, for the brand, but it definitely it led to expanding the resources in terms of development that we put behind it. So the we I would say that today as Move Free we had uh, we didn't have any we had the pillars we had were ultra and advanced, which one was a glucosamine chondroitin ingredient and one was a collagen ingredient. So that was how our architecture was. It wasn't very consumer first, it was very product based. And then what we moved to was uh, what regain and restore, preserve movement and elevate performance. And those were the three pillars. And essentially it meant that your regain and restore meant you had more serious issues. You were the one going to the, orthope um, the, uh, the more serious doctor, you needed more uh, relief. Preserve movement was you were starting to feel stiffness. Um, you were probably going to your general practitioner um, and you just needed something every day to, to avoid further decline. And then elevate performance whereas more athletic, like I wanna be the best I can be at running or the best I can be at performing. We didn't really play in that space, but actually China, uh, in the US we didn't, and China was starting to lean in there further. Um, and that was a stretch pillar for us. Um, and so it did lead to more projects and more funding in order to uh, explore those areas and build on them from an innovation pipeline perspective. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has any questions to send into the Q&A, feel free to pop them in. We do have another minute here. Um, otherwise, I'll let you stretch your legs before hopping into the next session. Um, I, saw, I saw one come through that I actually would love to hear Rachel's thought on um, that came yeah. through in the chat earlier. And somebody was mentioning that, you know, for large legacy brands moving quickly like this doesn't work because there are so many stakeholders involved. I know you've been at this for a while now, Rachel. What is your take on that and navigating this with a large legacy brand that has so many people who are just like staring at it to see what happens? Yeah, that's interesting because we, you know, for this particular brand, we had set up our whole structure to be more, like I said, the whole, our, we wanted in our DNA agility with authority. So we had already engaged the senior stakeholders that they needed to kind of like let us be a little bit. Mm -hmm. But that for other brands, uh, for example, our Mucinex brand, our Lysol brand, those are things that uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to make massive changes on without getting multiple stakeholders. So I think, I think, you know, I'm lucky that I'm in a company that, uh, and you spoke to heard Elaine yesterday that, uh, understands the importance of agility and moving fast. And so when we ask for engagement and I think it's making sure they're engaged in the process. So, um, you know, it was great to have the garage group remind us that we needed to make sure we had the stakeholders involved. And I think having our partners also, we often have our design partners remind us of that. And I think having our insights partners remind us of that as well. And saying, when are you gonna have your stakeholders involved? Um, it forces us to think about when we have our stakeholders involved um, and what those checkpoints are in order to make sure that they're either in the process 
um, at some point so that they're part of the process and engaged in that. And I think that that's important for uh, legacy brands. So if you're doing this on a large legacy brand, then I would think about if you have a three day workshop, when do they come in? Can you get them in on day two? Can you get them in on day three? Do you need to make it five days so that you have you know, a break in a day to have them come in? And I think it, it's, it's on then the team to think about how and when you want to engage, but you have to engage in that short-term process and have them part of the journey. Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye.